Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. And today we're going to finish up the introductory phase of my new series, Nathan's Being Nathan. Today we're going to finish up with my favorite Nathan, Nathan Oakley. Now, Nathan runs a daily Flat Earth debate channel. When I went on originally, when I first started up this channel, I did it mostly to get material. But quite frankly, I haven't bothered with him very much lately because I don't want to give him the views. But I've neglected him long enough. So let's cue up the music and have a look at Nathan Oakley, the Flat Earth debater. So to start with, we're going to lay some of the groundwork for this debate. And the way Oakley will do this is he will have one of his panel members softball him an assertion that he'll call on later. Let's have a listen. Well, I've just started discovering when I talk to Globers and I start by saying, do you have the, do you have the ground temperature data? Like what's the temperature of the ground or the temperature of the water and the atmospheric? When you start pressing them on that, because that's actually, those are the factors that can determine something's refracted or not. They say, well, you don't need that. As soon as they say they don't need that, they're done. Because that's their argument that things are refracted. So when you say things are refracted, because sinking and that stuff is part of refraction. If they don't give you the data, if they obfuscate the data, it's over. I had this happen on a oh. disc the other day. Yeah, but what, what they do, though, is they say, they say they can dispense with that because they've got standard refraction, which is obviously based on R, rather than based on the four key things like you just said, pressure, temperature, density, humidity, or whatever the factors are. I can't remember them off the top of my head. But the point is, you're right. They've got they've got this claim that you don't need all, all the empirical data when it suits them because they've got standard refraction. But when we question it, they say, well, if you're going to apply real-world refraction, you need to know all these along every point of the corridor. And it's like, oh, right, so it's different rules when we try and do it, but when they try doing it, this, oh, yeah, standard refraction is fine. But that's not really the way standard refraction works. Standard refraction is based on hundreds of thousands of observations and giving us an average amount of refraction in the atmosphere. For example, with their black swan photograph of the oil rigs. Now, 95 days out of 100, those photographs will show what we would normally expect to see on a spherical Earth, and that is that the near oil rig is higher than the far oil rig, and the far oil rig is partially obstructed by the curve of the Earth. Now, in five out of 100 cases, we have abnormal refraction going on, and you can tell that simply by looking at the photographs because they're extremely distorted. Here's the problem that you run into with this argument and the easiest way to counter it. Fine. I seem to recall one of those black swan photographs recorded the temperature of the water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and the temperature of the air at 64. It did not give a relative humidity nor a pollen count, or the level of dust in the air or the luminosity of the sun. However, based on those two numbers, if I change the temperature of the water to 56 degrees, and I change the temperature of the air to 72 degrees, how will that affect refraction? Can you do the mathematics to do that? Well, fortunately we can, because we've got Walter Bisslin. Now, this is Walter Bisslin's Advanced Earth Curve Calculator. Now, on his website, he actually has a section devoted to refraction of light. And it's a refraction calculator. And that's what we have up here. And I'll put a link to this in the description. We're going to have a standard refraction day to use as a comparison. And on the right, we're going to vary the conditions a little bit. So if you look at this photograph, you'll see that the water temperature and the air temperature are exactly the same. What happens if we increase the air temperature by two degrees centigrade? Oh my goodness, Chicago got a little higher on the horizon. Now 16 and 18 degrees Celsius is 60 and 64 degrees. So let's see what happens when we drop it down to about 56 degrees and we bring it up to about 72 degrees. Boy, that's quite a change, isn't it? Now, you can calculate this. However, we normally don't need to. This is kind of just something to help us do the math a little bit. We have three types of refraction in the atmosphere. We have normal atmospheric refraction, we have low refraction, and we have high refraction. The photograph on the left is normal refraction. The photograph on the right is high refraction. What's the problem with that? 
So I think that when Flat Earth attempts to demand we give them specific numbers when we're talking about refraction, beyond, say, saying normal atmospheric or high or low refraction, so fine, go ahead and show me the mathematics behind the numbers, go to refraction calculator, show me how it's going to make a difference, you know, to support your point. Otherwise, we're going to simply use high, low, and normal refraction. Now, 95 out of 100 days, you see normal refraction with those oil rigs in the black swan. Five out of 100 days, you may have high refraction. The one they keep throwing around with the massive distortions is high refraction. That's good enough. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You just point out the magic trick. Okay, if you're going to assert refraction, what refraction are you asserting? 07 over 6 R, we've debunked R. Can't use standard terrestrial refraction as it's actually accurately called. Terrestrial refraction uses R. Bye bye, we don't have an R value anymore, black swan. Maybe if you learnt the argument and understood how it had been debunked and why it's now untenable, you wouldn't be asserting standard refraction in the form of terrestrial 7 over 6 R because you don't have an R. Bye bye, globe. I'll tell you, I always love it when Nathan tries to sound scientific. Now, we perfectly know what the radius of the Earth is. We know what the shape of the Earth is. And those were all determined long ago by multiple different means. So that's really not an argument here. But what Nathan's argument is, is brilliant. What he's saying is that unless we can prove the value of R to his satisfaction, every mathematical formula that involves R needs to be thrown out. But that's not really the way it works. Let's go back over here to Bislin's calculator. Now this pretty much says it all right here. What refraction is, is the bending of light. When you bend light, you have a curve, and that curve itself has got a radius. That's kind of what defines a curve. So no matter what the curve of the refraction is, that curve itself will have a radius. Now under standard conditions, we can estimate what that curve is going to be. It's approximately seven over six times the radius of the surface of the Earth. If the radius of the Earth was different, it may be 7 over 9, or it may be 4 over 3. It doesn't really matter what the radius of the Earth is. We're simply using it as a constant. So the fact that the light itself is curving and the surface of the Earth is curving independently has no relationship to each other. I, I see some uh, kind of middle ground in, in both of what you guys were saying. Uh, even this morning, you know, when they're still talking about the black swan, it's they, they present the, uh, you know, clear day picture and then the fuzzy day picture. And they're still on about this. Look, you can see all the distortion. Right. So they, they want to say that there's some distortion from one side. But then back to uh, where this point opened up, they obfuscate and they don't want to have the numbers. My man said, as soon as they say you don't need it, they're done. It's like, but I do see some sort of middle ground. Now, once again, this is the second person coming in to reinforce the first point but trying to appear moderate. And that is saying, well, there is kind of some middle ground here. This is a valid point that he's bringing up. And that is that we bring up the clear pictures of the black swan. And then we point out the problems with the fuzzy picture of the black swan and the fact that it's high refraction. Now, this is a point that Nathan cannot overcome. So notice how he's going to go ahead and change the subject to the geometric versus the apparent horizon. So, Let's go ahead and continue. Not really. Can I, mean, can I, ask, can I ask you a question? I, I just so want to say that part they're, before you do, chocolate. That just one second, chocolate. Chocolate, just one second oh, before, you, my, before you do. My bad. So, yeah, your, your geometric horizon we discussed yesterday. I think it was our when we were discussing it with. This is a fixed value set in stone, inviolable, not to be changed. Because as soon as it is, it's no longer either the value that it must be or geometric so it is very much set in stone if they say oh we can argue about one image being fuzzy and therefore there's lots of refraction going on so not a geometric horizon then we've only got one this is the death of their model there's it's so cut and dry I, I totally agree with that argument okay so nathan's argument here is that unless we can actually verify that what we're looking at is the geometric horizon the earth is not a sphere well, first of all, nobody ever claimed we were looking at the geometric horizon. That's not our argument. We always look at an apparent horizon. 
Now let's go ahead and discuss the differences between a geometric and an apparent horizon. A geometric horizon is based on a shape and a size. The Earth is a sphere of a certain size. That sphere will have a geometric horizon to it based on the observation height. Now the difference between that and the apparent horizon is that the apparent horizon is refracted a little bit. So if you look at an observer at one position, the geometric horizon, for example, will be here, and the apparent horizon will be a little bit further on because instead of looking in a straight tangential line, you're looking at a curved line that curves over the top of the horizon a little bit. This is a normal, understandable, and reproducible phenomenon. So I don't understand the point between the two. Now, Nathan likes to point out that if we can't measure directly the geometric horizon, we can't measure the globe. Now, there are a number of ways that we can determine the radius of the Earth. For example, with Eratosthenes, we determine the circumference of the Earth based on very high angle light, which is minimally, if any, refracted. It's coming in from nearly 90 degrees above us. Second of all, we can determine the radius of the Earth by measuring a great circle course between two points on the surface of a sphere. That will give us the radius of the Earth. We do that every day with airliners and ships. Not a problem at all. And the third way that we can do it is using something called the method Al-Biruni, where we're actually up at a height, looking down and measuring the dip angle to the horizon. Now here's the problem that you run into. If you are very low to the ground, refraction is going to have a very significant impact on your calculation with Alberuni. It's going to increase the radius of the Earth. Now, how much will it do that? Well, could do it quite a bit if you're an inch above the water. However, if you're at 45,000 feet and the drop to the horizon is 3.75 degrees, which is easy to measure with an airplane, you get a radius of the Earth. You can compare that to the radius of the Earth determined from the other methods and find that the error is less than 0.8%. I don't think it's going to be that significant for our calculations, and it certainly does not indicate that the Earth is any shape other than curved. Well, the next question would be, can you have refraction that is not distorted? And as soon as you show that that's possible, they're done as well. So you can have refraction without distortion. Uh, uh, I mean, that's obvious. Uh, 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 nope. You're back onto this having refraction. No, no, no. Their refraction is terrestrial refraction, and they can't have it. Sorry. This arguing about real refraction and whether or not we're going to qualify. Who cares? They don't have that. It's not what they use. It's irrelevant. There, Dad. You see how he's going back to his original argument that if we can't prove R to his satisfaction, refraction doesn't exist? I mean, does that make any sense? This is the type of debate tactics that Nathan Oakley likes to use. And this is why normal people don't really go and debate him, because he's just trying to twist things around in his own mind and redefine things. And there's no way to win against that. If you start to win, he will either shout you down, mute you, or change the subject. And then, of course, there's going to be ad homs throughout the entire process. So it's a rather abusive process, and I do not recommend people go on to this show and try and participate in this charade, but it's fun to watch once in a while. Well, we've laid the groundwork for the debate. In our next episode, we're going to see what happens when somebody comes in to try and argue the globe with this panel in this environment. So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe. And remember, we have memberships and a Patreon. Pretty soon, we're even going to have a channel store where you can get cool stuff from Bob the Science Guy. In the next episode, we're going to see Rumpus come in. And I look forward to seeing you then. Take care, guys.